Okay, thank you, Alexei, for the introduction. And thank you, uh, the guys at NASPEC, to put together this super nice workshop, different topics, all related with the snow. Um, in particular, I don't know if the presentation. Yeah. So I will talk today about the um, nano optics and how do we do yes optics at the nanoscale using phonon polaritons in this case. And some things that I show you here are uh, very fundamental optical phenomena like reflection or refraction or even wave guiding that has some exotic behavior at the nanoscale when one is using um, this kind of hyperbolic nanolite. So polaritons which propagate very anisotropically in the material. Um, I think I will have only time to show you something about negative reflection and the others maybe I just mentioned. So, yeah, this is the outline. So I want to first talk a little bit about hyperbolic nanolite. First of all, what is nanolite? Nanolite for us is um, surface polaritons. And for decades, it was studied using uh, metals and basically surface plasmons where the collective excitation of electrons, free electrons, is able to screen out the incident field because of the negative permittivity of the material, and this creates a surface wave which has some uh, interesting properties like a very large wave vector, so very short wavelength, and also they can enhance the incident field quite a lot. So then all the development of shares and all these techniques, right, in a spectroscope. Um, but plasmons have some problems. Uh, they have some advantages, like they, they, they exist in the visible, and that's good for some applications, but also they have some uh, drawbacks, like very short lifetimes because of electron-electron scattering is very uh, is predominant. And uh, they have other problems, like the lack of active tunability and so on. But um, it is now quite popular to study phonon polaritons, but several years ago, or like 10, 15 years ago, I think there were just a few works on phonon polaritons, maybe done by, by Reina and, and the group at that time. Um, they were based on bulk material, silicon carbide and quartz, and these works are done in the infrared, mid-infrared, because at those frequencies, these materials, they also have a negative permittivity that can screen out the incident field and create these surface waves. But in this case, they are surface phonon polarities. They involve the lattice vibrations. And this happens between the TO and LO phonons, and as I say, this is six microns wavelength, seven microns wavelength, until 30 microns wavelength or even longer, okay? So the good thing about them is that because they don't involve electron-electron scattering, it's just phonons. Phonon-phonon scattering occurs in, 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 in time scales that are much longer. Then the lifetime of these waves on the surface is quite long. And then the, the confinement is already is also very, very high of these waves. You can shrink light very much with phonon polaritons. And they are in the infrared, mid-infrared, where molecules, uh, they have these vibrations, and then for sensing and other applications, they are quite important. They also have some uh, drawbacks. For example, they only exist between these TO and LO phonons, so very narrow spectral bands. We have worked during years, during the last few years, trying to expand this, uh, this region to have more excitations. But it's a difficult thing for phonon polaritons, but, well, they also have this advantages, right, that they are long life. Um, as I said, it was first a study with this bulk material, silicon carbide, and it's a very difficult material to engineer at that time, to do nanostructures and to do thin fields and so on. So then the advent of, of 2D materials came into play and in the right time uh, together with the uh, commercialization of SNOM um, of, by NASPEC, and then all together did that this field of uh, nano-optics in 2D materials has grown exponentially during the last years. And particularly uh, by uh, visualizing, yeah, uh, plasmons in graphene, uh, uh, but also lately these phonon polaritons in Van der Waals materials like HBN, and I will show you now also molybdenum trioxide, and there are others. There are also others, like other speakers, they talk other excitations in these Van der Waals materials that are still to be, uh, like these two, for example, to be studied in depth. So, but let me introduce this alpha molybdenum trioxide material. It's a Van der Waals material, set, so it can be bought by in powder, and then you can take it and exfoliate very easily, okay? Very cheap, 
and very easy to get uh, nice flakes. These are how they look. They are quite anisotropic because the lattice uh, structure is very anisotropic. It's an orthorhombic material. Um, this anisotropy with very different lattice uh, constants along the three directions of space is translated into the optical properties as well. So as you can see here in the uh, FTA, uh, in the yeah, far field spectra of the, of the of the of one flake, a big flake, as a function of polarization, you can see that there are peaks, reflection peaks, at some polarizations, but there are not at, at others. So the material behaves like a metal for some polarizations and like an electric for others. This is the main characteristic of this material. In the plane, it is metallic along one direction, but it is dielectric along another. And in between, it's a mix. So, well, it's a mix. It's metallic, but it's getting more dielectric. So, um, so the experiment was, okay, we, we got these flakes and we have this um, behavior, so we think this occurs between some TO phonons, so TOLO phonons, optical phonons. So we use this norm, as you, you know, I will not enter into details of how it works and how we measure is just simple uh, uh, as you saw here, as you see here. Um, we excite these waves, and here I already anticipate how these waves propagate in this material. They have this hyperbolic shape, and it's quite peculiar, okay? But at the time we didn't know, and then we measure at here, where we have some crystalline band, this band where phonopolaritons can exist, and then at this other band. And what we saw is that these phonopolaritons have different periodicities of different directions. And particularly in this band, it has some periodicity here, but there is no, there are no polarities here. So as I said, here it has like, it's like a metal, but in the other direction it's not a metal. Okay, how can we see this better? Uh, well, we did uh, some disk, and then we probe, you know that with, with uh, SNOM and polariton imaging, we do like echo detection. So we launch the polaritons, and then we measure what is reflected back to the tip, okay? So the best way to, to understand how polaritons propagate along different directions for us was to make a disk and probe all directions. And by doing so in these two restraining bands, we saw and tweaking the Fourier transform, the Fourier, by taking the Fourier transform, we get these curves, these so frequency curves in momentum space, where it, they are very intuitive to, to understand the, how the, the, the polaritons propagate in this in this medium, particularly in this region, they have this elliptical shape, so they propagate with elliptical wavefronts, let's say. And in this other, uh, with this other pattern, this uh, almond, si almond type pattern, then it becomes this hyperbolic propagation. So this hyperbolic isofrequency curve, where I want to, to explain you a little bit more, well, in the following slide, but before, why a part of this crazy anisotropic uh, propagation in the plane, why these phonopolarities are interesting in moldenon trioxides? Because their lifetime, propagating lifetime, is very long. So there are not very many losses, and the, the lifetimes can reach eight picoseconds in the elliptical ring, which is a lot. Um, one, one note here, the lifetime is for propagating phonopolarities, and it's given by the propagation distance divided by the velocity, so it's for a wave that is propagating. Because I saw lately some papers where they are using this definition for resonators, and I don't know how they get published, and I don't understand why, but just I want to mention this here. Um, uh, so another way to see this propagation, this hyperbolic propagation, is to put like an, an antenna on top of the, of the material and see how these waves emanate from the antenna and how they propagate, and this is how we see them in the SNOM. And what I wanted to say, the most particular feature here is that the pointing vector, which is by definition perpendicular to the isofrequency curve, is almost perpendicular to the K vectors, to the wave vector. So this means that the wave front is almost perpendicular to the direction where the energy is propagating. So the wave is propagating in this direction, but the wave fronts are completely tilted. Okay, this is not the, the standard wave that we study at the university and the optics lectures, okay? It's completely anisotropic. So what this means to the most fundamental phenomena like reflection or refraction? And this is what I wanted to say you, to, to show you here that they being uh, quite exotic uh, effects. Let's, let me take you back to the, to the university, to the optics lectures, um, this um, specular reflection on a mirror, looking at it as a, as a as a momentum conservation principle, so we know that at the interface, the, the, the momentum projection to the interface needs to be conserved, right, on this, on this phenomena. 
So if we have this uh, incident wave, and we have uh, with this k vector, this is the projection to the boundary, the k vector, so we need another uh, vector k in this space, isotropic space, then is given by a, a circle, a circumference, where we have the same k projection on the boundary. Okay, this is how we can see reflection in momentum in space. And then we have this pointing vector, which is normal to the curve, so we can explain this specular reflection. But what happens if we now have a hyperbolic medium? As I showed you before, K and S, pointing vector and wave vector, are not collinear anymore. In isotropic media, they are always collinear. And this is what makes things more exotic. So if we have a wave that comes with this uh, wave vector and this pointing vector here, which in this case is the only direction where they are collinear, we have this projection, and then the only vector, wave vector that fulfills this same uh, projection to the boundary is this other wave vector which has this pointing vector. This means that if light is coming to the mirror in this direction, because of momentum conservation, light is coming out on the same side of the normal to the, to the surface. So it's coming negatively to the, to the boundary. And this is what is called negative reflection. And it has been studied with metamaterials with normally light, not ordinary light, but now we want to visualize it at a nanoscale, so with phonon polaritons. So we have these phonon polaritons, these nice phonon polaritons that are hyperbolic in the plane, so they have this property of having non-collinear S and K. So what we did it was to fabricate mirrors and try to see this uh, reflection. But let me remind you again that what we visualize with our snow is working like an echo detector. So we are not having a snapshot of the reflection like having a photo. What we have is the tip that is launching these polaritons and they are coming back to the tip. So the detection is at the tip again. And this makes things a bit more complicated because what we only measure back reflected polaritons. But okay, back reflection is this condition. So we have just normal to the boundary, the K that is normal to the boundary, it has comes normal to the boundary, it comes back normal to the boundary again. And in the, the, the case in hyperbolic media is this one, where we have these two Ks that are normal to the boundary, but the pointing vector has other directions. So basically what we will see is this kind of uh, back reflection from a different angle. Okay, we did the experiments. This is the isotropic case. So we have these parallel fringes to the boundaries that you are used if you are studying polaritons in, with the SNOM. We are using, seeing always these interference fringes. But now if we measure in hyperbolic media, we see these interferic fringes not, they are parallel to the boundary because K is going in this direction, but S, the propagation direction of the wave, is in a completely different direction. Okay, it's completely out of the normal. And this is a, very basic effect, right? It's just reflection and visualize at the scale. We just measure other angles, and then by understanding reflection in this media, you can do a retro reflector where all the waves in the hyperbolic medium can come back to the source. And um, we derive this equation for a retro reflector, and it's it's kind of a hyperbolic shape, and it's quite exotic, I think. And I finish, Alexei. Yeah, don't worry too much. And um, we can do this kind of uh, nano resonators where we have two retro reflectors where you can make a cavity in the middle, and this is the cavity for making an antenna in a hyperbolic medium, a typical rectangle cavity. What I saw also in the in different publications lately, they are not cavities for hyperbolic media. They, they is not not all the waves are coming back reflecting from one, front, one, from one edge to the other. We need this kind of, well, hyperbolic shapes. And with this I finish, I just uh, give some advertisement of this poster, P34, of our normal refraction. Also, we measure a normal refraction. Um, yeah, that's it. Uh, we also did some wave guiding. I think Xi Yuan is going to present something related to this, so you will, you will see this natural canalization that happens when you, you twist two layers of MO3, and then we have like some canalization effects. And with this, I, I finish, and thanks to all the people in the group, and you all for your attention and collaborators, of course, and if you have questions. Please.